wait and see if we get at least one or two more others, but um, let me go ahead and start. Um, let me know if you want to uh, cover anything in particular. So, uh, But yeah, I'll go ahead and uh, do what I was planning on here so I can post the video as usual. Um, so to begin with, uh, just reminders. Um, um, I was going to start with the assignment four, see if anybody had any questions on that. Um, so that was posted. I'm looking for that still by the end of this week. Uh, the um, um, I don't think most people will find it too difficult. Uh, so it has the same format as the previous one in terms of the workflow and things. So. Uh, we've got, uh, I don't know, four or five tasks. Uh, no, no, there's, there's just like two main tasks broken up into a couple of smaller parts on this fourth one here. So, um, let me look at it real quick. So, uh, Um, now I'm going to change my mind. I'm going to open that back up. So just um, on that, so let me know. I know people will probably um, uh, start working on it in earnest uh, this week. So I don't think I've got any questions on it yet, but uh, let me know if you have any questions on it. Um, there is one thing, if I, was, if, if I would have had more time, I probably would have had people create a function in order to plot, in order to visualize the decision boundary from the support vector machines for the assignment four. So right now, uh, you have to do, make, you have to fit uh, probably three or four different versions of a support vector machine, starting with like a linear one, uh, and then a couple of them where you do it with a kernel. Um, and uh, for the ones where it's nonlinear, um, I do ask you to plot a decision boundary using the uh, the, the, the method that we've seen a couple times where you create a contour plot uh, over a grid in order to be able to figure out where the decision boundary ends up being. So um, it, might, it would probably be a good idea, uh, and I wish I would have made this a part of the assignment, but you pretty much have to do the same code uh, for the nonlinear decision boundary that you plot. So you might want to think about um, just writing a function to do that. In fact, if you want to, you can even put that function inside of the um, the uh, um, inside of the, the the file, right? So, so there, there wasn't asked to do this, but you can go ahead and put that function inside of the assignment tasks. Um, uh, that would probably be a good idea. So instead of copying and pasting the uh, the the code to visualize. The decision boundary each time. You might want to just go ahead and do that yourself. Uh, go ahead and put it into your assignment tasks. So, um, yeah. So looking at the task, what there was, um, um, uh, there's three tasks on this assignment. Uh, so, uh, so I broke the first one up in, into two or three different things. So it's really just loading the data and fitting a, a linear classifier, uh, and then I ask you to create your own. Uh, version of the, the Gaussian kernel, so implement the function in order to uh, calculate the similarity between two different sets of vectors for the second task on the assignment, and then there was also a task three uh, to do a, like a nonlinear kernel. So, um, so the, the, I think most people will find it relatively quick to do the assignment for if you haven't got started on it already. Um, although there's a little bit more than what's implied from these functions that you have to, to finish on the assignment tasks. So in particular, you might want to also kind of go ahead and add your own, like I was just saying, uh, in order to plot the decision boundaries for the nonlinear ones. You have to do that two or three times. Uh, so it might be better to, to pull that out as a separate function. So. Um, So uh, yeah, so I, I'll leave that there for people that see this later um, or, or, or 
you guys that are here. Uh, let me know if anybody has any questions on that. I haven't got any questions yet, but hopefully everybody has started working on that, has at least looked at it. Um, I haven't even checked uh, how people are doing in terms of at least accepting the assignment yet or not. So we'll probably go into some more details of that on Thursday in case anybody runs into some issues or has some difficulties or things. So just let me know. Um, Oh, kind of another thing, so getting back to some overview stuff before I get into decision trees here. Uh, we do have, what, like this week and two more weeks, uh, actually before Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving's kind of uh, pretty late. This time we've only got like, like, what, maybe two weeks after Thanksgiving, I think. Uh, so yeah, we are going to go through the decision trees, the ensemble learning, uh, and actually get started on dimensionality reduction. So, um, um, so starting today, uh, we're looking at, what is it, the, um, um, uh, deci the, the chapter six and seven on decision trees and then on the ensembles. So um, even though I split this out over two weeks, um, but um, uh, there's a lot of overlap. The, the biggest uh, interesting ensembles are really ensembles of trees. So that's really what random forests are. Uh, but we'll, we'll talk about that next week. So, but uh, lots of people do use um, um, random forests. Um, it's kind of one of the standard things in machine learning uh, toolkit uh, that uh, a lot of practitioners use. So it's a good one to try to try out. So uh, it would be a good one to try out on your um, um, projects that hopefully everybody is, is working. Oh, uh, yeah, I was going to mention that as well. So. Um, I'd meant to do this. I haven't done it yet, but uh, hopefully everybody that's seen this uh, has remembered to accept the, uh, the, the the final project and has indicated uh, uh, the data set that you're planning on using. Um, I haven't I haven't checked. I need to do that. I haven't checked to see if um, uh, if anybody's requested to use the same uh, data sets or not. So uh, I'll try to get that done here so that uh, if, I, if I do have some people trying to use the same thing that I get um, um, uh, uh, get you uh, get them restarted on the next one. Hopefully that's not the case. Hopefully everybody's most everybody's picked uh, something unique. Um, but uh, but yeah, you know, uh, don't don't forget about that. Keep working on that. It's a good idea for things like that to at least do a little bit of, of uh, something on that every week. Uh, so that you don't end up with having to do a lot of stuff at the end, right? So I, I would uh, kind of as a suggestion, um, um, I would suggest that, uh, you know, make certain that you have done the, the thing I asked for like the week before, that you did accept the assignment um, and you modified your README to indicate what data set you're going to use. Um, I would I would. Uh, suggest that uh, this week um, that you get your data set into your repository uh, for that project um, and maybe get a, uh, a notebook working that loads it um, and does some uh, maybe some initial exploration so at least maybe you know uh, loads it um, and does like a summary and uh, a description those basic kinds of things that we do so get started thinking about uh, exploring your data set so. That would be a good thing to do this week. Um, but yeah, don't forget about that. I'll, I'll try and keep reminding people about that uh, to try and make some little progress on um, on uh, your uh, last project as well um, as we're doing stuff in the course here. So, but yeah, so we're gonna to look at decision trees today. Um, um, I don't know if I'll go over. Uh, been too long, even though we started a little bit late, um, uh, so we don't have a whole lot of, of material on the decision trees. Uh, next week, then we'll look at ensembles. Uh, we've got a little bit more stuff to cover um, uh, on that, uh, and then there's kind of a natural break. Um, so, so kind of looking ahead here, so beginning to talk about decision trees. Uh, decision trees are another one that's a little bit different of uh, the way they work from like support vector machines and linear and logistic regression. Um, um, and uh, they, uh, but, but they do still have kind of the concept of we do de define a 
sort of a decision function. So we are going to be doing a little bit of, of a search of an optimization for the decision tree. So the, they're, uh, they're kind of in between the nearest neighbor, the, the KNN that we talked about um, before, um, and like support vector machines or logistic regression. So uh, I'm jumping ahead here, but, but, but we'll see some examples of these. Uh, decision tree, kind of like, like K&N, uh, like I mentioned, uh, decision, decision trees have one really nice property. They are uh, pretty understandable. So once you build a decision tree, you can actually examine it and understand what it's doing a lot easier than you can with you know, the, the parameters, the, the fitted thetas that you end up with, like with a support vector machine or logistic regression. So. Um, so that's one good thing about decision tree. So, all right, and then yeah, before I uh, get into the actual stuff, um, uh, back to this. Uh, looking ahead, there is kind of a natural break. So after we do the decision trees and the ensemble learning, um, uh, we're actually going to uh, spend the, la the last three weeks of the course of, um, on a uh, on a slightly different topic. So we'll, we'll look at unsupervised learning, right? So um, uh, we don't spend as much time as that as, as we do on supervised learning, uh, but there's some useful stuff to know about doing dimensionality reduction and uh, PCA and some other stuff here for the last uh, three weeks on unsupervised learning. So. Um, Also, uh, maybe I'll mention uh, here, because I was thinking about Thanksgiving here for the first time this week here, making some plans. Um, I'm probably not, uh, we, as usual, um, the, the university is off on like Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Um, I'm probably not going to have an official class on Tuesday of that week as well, um, although I will be in my office hours, so I won't be gone. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, if, if, if anybody's making plans for Thanksgiving, just um, 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 we, won't, we probably won't have a meeting on that Thanksgiving week on the Thursday uh, uh, when they still have classes. So. Um, so at least as far as this class is concerned, you can um, uh, maybe make other plans if you need to for that week. So, uh, In fact, if you look at the, um, um, the schedule of stuff, um, uh, we, we skip over. I don't have anything um, um, set to, to be covered on that week, um, although um, you know, we do begin dimensionality reduction, so uh, you can be working on, I will post the final assignment six uh, before that Thanksgiving week so that you can at least uh, look at it and start working on it. Um, uh, it will be due like the week after. Uh, we get back from the, the Thanksgiving. So. Okay, uh, I think that's enough of uh, procedural stuff. So let's let's get started. Uh, let me go ahead and kind of cover the decision tree notebook here a little bit. So, um, Okay, so decision trees are um, kind of the basis of random forests. So decision trees, basic decision trees are probably not, you know, uh, considered state of the art in terms of, uh, you know, a machine learning classifier or regression. You can do both regression and classification with decision trees. Um, so if you did the reading from the textbook, you'll see it covers both of those. I'll, I'll cover uh, uh, mostly classification to start with, and we'll talk about regression maybe on, on Thursday. I'm not certain if we'll get to that today or not. Um, so, but yeah, like, like we talked about for support vector machines, you can do uh, either regression or classification with the decision tree. Um, the, the, the power of decision trees is really when you make an ensemble of them. So uh, random forests um, are can be pretty powerful, uh, so they can compete with uh, some considered some of the best uh, machine learning um, uh, methods. Uh, sometimes, in some cases, if you do a, a, a random forest. So, but it's it's good to understand the, the basics of how a decision tree works before you look at how you might ensemble a bunch of them uh, to get a more powerful result uh, using uh, like a random forest or other variations of that kind of an ensemble. So. 
Um, so let's look. Let's just dump into the basics. So all this this material is you know uh, directly from our hands-on machine machine learning textbook again. So Dr. Ng's uh, video lectures that I point you guys to. He doesn't cover uh, trees or ensembles. Um, so this is all just directly coming from our HML, HOML uh, textbook now. Um, so, uh, let me go ahead and uh, rerun some of these cells here. Um, so if you looked at the textbook, uh, we start off uh, using, uh, doing some classification on decision tree, using the decision tree to do classification. Uh, we're using the Irish data set again, so we've, we've, we've looked at the Irish data set before. Uh, again, like we've done uh, previously, for examples, uh, we're just using uh, two of the features so we can easily visualize the result, uh, the resulting classifier that's made um, uh, when we do our decision trees here. Um, so in this case, what we're, we're selecting the last two uh, features, so that corresponds to the pedal length and the pedal width uh, on the Irish data set. So you know, at this point, you should be pretty familiar with the the overall the pattern of how you do stuff if we're using Scikit-Learn. So you know, if we want to do a classifier, we just use a decision tree classifier. If we want to use regression, we can use a decision tree regressor. Um, uh, in that case, so you have to do something slightly different in terms of uh, the uh, thing you want to optimize, whether depending on if you're doing classification or regression. So, but you know, um, same kind of thing. Um, there's there's a lot more meta parameters uh, than some of the other methods that we've looked at before. Um, so you can specify things like the depth, maximum depth of the tree. Um, Let's bring up the contextual help here for the uh, uh, decision tree classifier. So uh, uh, we've got a lot of meta parameters. Uh, so these would be the kinds of things that you could tune in order to fight regularization, like we've talked about, um, and uh, do the other kinds of stuff. So you know, uh, we don't have that same idea of weights um, and uh, either having a penalty or not, uh, depending on like our uh, theta weights like we did. So to fight, uh, if you're overfitting uh, a decision tree, it's very easy to overfit a decision tree. In fact, the, the, the default, if you don't specify any of these, is you'll get a decision tree that will perfectly fit the data you, um, you give it, uh, but it might not do well at generalizing, right? So you have, but you have lots of things you can tweak uh, the, the depth, um, the, um, what are some of these others? Um, the num maximum number of leaf nodes for the tree, resulting tree, uh, the number of samples that you use when you're doing a split. Um, um, and there's other things, right? So I don't know uh, 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 what people generally use, uh, I, I think, you know, uh, while there's lots of things you can try out if you're trying to tweak a basic decision tree, uh, the, the basic ones are like the depth uh, and the number of nodes, so, so specifying the number of leaf nodes uh, if, if you need to uh, constrain your decision tree. So most people will start with those, like um, um, max depth or uh, max leaf nodes um, are two basic ones to try. Um, I wanted to mention, um, I only fixed this uh, the other day, uh, so uh, if, if, um, uh, if you haven't done a, a poll recently, you might not have had your notebook working. Um, so this export graph, the, the, uh, the path to the figures wasn't uh, specified correctly. Uh, but, but just to show you, so here we'd, we'd fit a classifier using the decision tree for the iris data set. Um, and we limited it to have, uh, at most, a tree of depth two. Uh, and again, this is directly from the, uh, the textbook here. 
right? So um, um, there's a couple of things. These are just uh, uh, utility methods that scikit-learn has. So you can um, use this export to graph viz in order to visualize the resulting tree, which can be uh, uh, useful just for uh, illustrating uh, what goes on here, right? Um, this function should work um, um, as long as, you, uh, you know, since it comes directly from scikit-learn. Uh, but if you want to um, view, if you want to create the, 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 the image file, um, you'd need this dot utility uh, uh, that the, uh, um, um, is shown here in this notebook. Um, and uh, if you're not using, this is kind of a Linux, Unix sort of thing, so if you're not using Unix or Linux, uh, you might not easily have those. So if you're using the um, dev, dev, the, uh, the, the dev container, the environment uh, for our uh, uh, class resources, um, you should be able to open up a terminal. Um, you do need to both install the graph viz for the operating system. So this first one, uh, the apt install is actually installing the operating system graph viz package. Um, that's where the dot command comes from. Um, uh, if you want to use the, the thing shown below here, though, you also need to install graph viz as a Python package. Although I found out, um, um, yeah, I mean, this still doesn't seem to be fixed. So uh, the kind of install graph viz is not working uh, right now for some reason, so uh, at least for me. So in our class dev containers, you probably have to use the um, uh, pip install uh, if you want to get this to work here uh, to use the graph viz as a Python package. Um, and if you're using Windows or not using a dev container, you may not be able to do this kind of stuff. For example, I don't know if there's an equivalent uh, easy way to get uh, the GraphViz uh, package installed so you can do stuff like uh, you know, uh, create the PNG from this dot file uh, that's generated on like Windows. So. Uh, but anyway, if you have those installed, uh, all this is doing is generating this PNG. So, oops, I thought I fixed this. Um, so yeah, you really don't need the Python graph viz unless you want to do this here. This is uh, nicer if I, to, to more, um, um, uh, so, so I have this in here so that I can uh, try some different trees. We can see how that affects uh, the, the resulting decision tree that's made uh, more easily. Uh, otherwise, right, if we um, um, uh, try and display the, the PNG file using a, uh, a markdown, you have to reload the notebook in order to get the new uh, PNG file, which is a little bit inconvenient to do. So that was the only reason why um, I showed this alternative method in order to display a PNG uh, using the GraphViz uh, Python package um, um, and um, um, sourcing it from a, a dot file. So, But yeah, now that I think about it though, yeah, if you, if you can get the GraphViz working in your Python, uh, you wouldn't, you probably wouldn't need the, um, um, the operating system package that has this dot command. So, so having the GraphViz uh, Python package successfully working, you ought to be able to do this kind of stuff um, and use the, the source um, uh, from a dot file uh, directly in order to see these, if, if you're interested in seeing the resulting trees. So. Um, so anyway, that, that's all just so that uh, for the rest of the class that we can um, uh, look at the, the results when we create a decision tree. So let's go back and, and, and look at what happens here. Um, so uh, this first example that we're doing on the Irish data set, so we've only got two features, the pedal length and the pedal width. So you'll notice, and, and we're limiting the uh, depth to be two here. So we're going to end up with a decision tree that has a depth of two. So if we look at this, um, uh, this is the resulting uh, decision tree. Um, um, and depth, uh, the, the, the root is considered depth zero. So, uh, so this is really a depth two tree. 
uh, here. So we would call this uh, depth 0, 1, and 2 uh, for the resulting tree. The, the decision tree is really a binary tree. Um, so it, it makes a binary decision at every node, okay? So this is... Um, 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 so I don't know if I talk about it in the lecture notebook here, but um, the, uh, the textbook talks a little bit about um, um, white box versus black box um, models. Where is that in our textbook? I thought it did. Anyway, so I, I know it talks a little bit about that somewhere. So um, uh, the so I mentioned this before, but the one nice thing about decision trees is the model when you fit them to a set of data to do like a make a classifier, like in this case, uh, the resulting model is is quite understandable to uh, to a person, to a human that wants to understand how the classifiers are working. Because basically, uh, when you fit a decision tree, uh, the result is a binary tree. Um, if you wanted to, if you took the, the resulting binary tree, you could do, you could use it to do classifications by hand. Of course, for a real data set, you'd end up with a much larger tree. It'd be um, uh, kind of difficult, uh, it'd be more complex. Um, but yeah, but by limiting this to depth two, um, we can easily see how we would make a decision. So uh, what happened, the root node, for whatever reason, when it fit the model, decided that we were going to make a decision based on pedal length. Um, so if the pedal length, remember we've got two features, length, pedal length and pedal width. If the pedal length was smaller than that value, um, um, we would go over here to the, to the left on the, the binary decision. Right, so if it's true that the pedal length is 2.4, we 2.45, we would go uh, over left. If it's false, if it's bigger than 2.45, uh, we make a further um, uh, decision, a further question. Right. So, in, in, for a decision tree, whenever you get to a leaf node, that means that's the, the place where a decision is made. Right, so in this case, we end up with three leaf nodes uh, in our depth two tree here. Um, so some information that's shown here. So the, the data set, uh, the IRS data set that we had um, has uh, th three classes. Um, um, so for doing classification, it's a multi-class problem. Uh, it has 50 in each one of them, um, uh, the Satosa, the Versicolor, and the Virginica. Right? Um, so to decode a little bit of what's being shown here, um, in the visualization of the first decision tree that we fit. Um, for example, uh, going over here, uh, when we made our first decision based on the pedal length, uh, there, was actually, there was actually 50 items um, who have a pedal length of less than 2.45. Um, uh, so of, of the 150 items, 50 items, uh, it was true when we, we made our first um, um, decision here in the decision tree. And 100 items uh, have a pedal length greater than 2.45. So that's really what the samples mean. So after that decision, we split it up into uh, 50 have less than 2.45 and, uh, and 100 have greater than 2.45. And the other thing here, the reason why the, this Gini measure that we'll talk about uh, in a bit is zero here um, is that we had perfect separation. So of the 50 items, all 50 items uh, were in the Satosa class, and none of the items were in any other class. Right? So whenever you get to, to a node like that, uh, you can't really split it any further because um, I don't have anything in any other class. So you'll always end up in a leaf node if you have everything in one of the classes if you get classification, and nothing remaining in any of the other classes. Right? So in that case, uh, basically what we're saying is if the pedal length is 2.45, uh, 
Uh, if I want to make a prediction on unseen data that we didn't train with, we would just predict that it's a Satosa class because in the data that, that we fit our model with here, um, all Satosas and none of the others um, had pedal lengths of 2.45. Um, and uh, we'll see that when we go and look at the decision boundary here, um, uh, what that meant or how that worked um, uh, for our data here. But uh, going the other way, so anything that had a, a larger pedal length, um, we made a, a further um, decision. So we have a decision node instead of a leaf node here. Um, and in this case, you know, it makes sense because we've still got things in the Versicolor and the Virginica classes. Right? So uh, by making the decision um, on the other feature, the pedal width, um, if it's less than 1.45, uh, we can go over here. So if the true, we always go left on the binary tree, and the false, we always go right um, here. So based on that decision, um, uh, we end up with 45, or sorry, 54 samples have a pedal width of less than 1.75, and we don't get perfect separation with that decision, but most of them were versicolor. Um, so 49 and 54 samples uh, were versicolor. So again, since we limit it to depth two, if we were to use this decision tree for prediction, um, and we have a new sample that had a pedal length that was less than that, uh, and a pedal width that was less than 1.75, we would end up down here at this leaf node, so we, we would just predict versicolor anytime we come down to here. Um, and on the right-hand side, we had 46 of our 100 samples on this split um, that had pedal widths that were greater than 1.75. Um, and of those, uh, 45 and 46 were uh, Virginica. Most of them were uh, of the other class here. Um, so I'll come back to, I wanted to show the decision boundary here uh, for our classifier that we have so far. Uh, I'll come back to the Gini, uh, the, the, the measure that we're using when we fit our model here. But um, if I get the whole thing in there. So um, for our current tree, we can see that, that the, so the root node we made a decision on the, uh, the pedal width at uh, 2.45. So I'm going to go back and forth between these. But our first decision here was on uh, 2.45 on the pedal length. Uh, these might be mislabeled here. I think, I think that's just a mistake in the notebook. can't believe I didn't see that before. So let's check here. So I think that looks correct. So, so again, going back to our tree that we'd created, uh, we were making a decision on pedal length. Uh, and anything that had a less than 2.45 uh, should have been over in the Satosa class. We had 50 of those. Anything greater uh, was in that remaining 100 samples of the 150. And so, uh, so you uh, will notice here that uh, yeah, our, our 2.45 on the decision boundary, everything less than that uh, are the 50 samples in the Satosa class. So yeah, I think that's labeled correctly now since we're doing uh, pedal length uh, at 2.45 first here. Uh, and then the 100 samples that were the right um, were um, uh, bigger, had a pedal length bigger than that. 
So all of those were in the other two classes, the uh, Versicola and the Virginica. Um, and then our second decision in the tree. So notice uh, one thing about the decision boundary that's made. So for the decision tree, it has to pick one feature, uh, and then it has to make a binary decision at, at every decision point in the tree. So that means that your decision boundaries are always going to be perpendicular to um, your features. Right? So, so we can only create a linear boundary at, at, for every decision that we make. Right? So since we limited it to depth 2, um, uh, our, our second decision uh, is going to have to be aligned. I mean, we, we could make a decision. You could still make another decision uh, using pedal length or pedal width um, for reasons that I'll uh, probably get to here in a bit. It decided to use pedal width as the best uh, feature for the next decision. But notice there's no place we could have made a line that would is not linearly separable if we're just concentrating on these 100 items. Right. So the, the decision it made there at the uh, 1.65, um, 1 1.75 for the pedal width, uh, we end up with um, most of the Versicolor have a pedal width less than that, except for the three, one, two, three, four, five samples. Right. Um, and again, if you go back and look at uh, uh, what's shown here, that should that figure down there should correspond to this state here. So the ones that have pedal width less than that, uh, we have 54 items, and five of those are, are in the wrong class, or at the wrong side of that decision boundary that we made uh, for the pedal width. Uh, and we should have ended up with only one misclassified above that. So if we look here, um, Um, so there should be one uh, versicolor uh, up above here. Um, so uh, most likely it's, it's a point that's exactly below one of the other ones, so we can't really see it. Uh, maybe that's the reason why. But, but yeah, so there should be one on there. Um, don't, I'm not spotting at the moment. Um, I'll, I'll assume it's just behind one of these. Uh, uh, is the reason why we can't see it here. Um, all right, but we, you know, in, in this case, you know, we, we limited it, we stopped it at depth two, but we could have continued on, uh, you know, we can't continue on um, um, uh, splitting over here since we've got a, a Gini of zero. We've got a, a perfect separation. There's no more classes, right? So, so, you, so it doesn't make any sense to make any more decisions here. But, but we could have done a further decision to like maybe try and uh, get those split out somehow, right? So, uh, so the reason why I wanted to have my notebook like this, let's, let's try changing it. So uh, let's go a little bit further on the depth. Let's let it keep going here. Um, so we'll let it go down to a depth of three instead of two here. Um, So in order to see those things, again, I have to create the, you have to have to run this function in order to create this dot file. Um, and then um, um, I can either generate the PNG from that, or this is what I was talking about before, is uh, I can just reuse this uh, in my Python notebook to visualize the new tree of depth three here. Uh, so since I allow it to go to depth three, um, I've now got zero, one, two, three depth. So, and I, I where I stopped at, a, at these as leaf nodes before, uh, we, we try and go further down, uh, splitting those, right? Um, although uh, we get one of these down to a Gini of zero, also, so we end up with, with one of our decisions uh, where we have a final leaf node, but the others still have some mixing, some non-zero uh, Gini measures here. Um, and let's, hopefully this will work here. So if I replot our decision tree, um, I should hopefully be able to see, um, I don't know if I'll be able to see all of them, but some of the ones that we just did here. So we've still got the, um, the one at um, our, our root, so the pedal length of 2.45 is still the same as we had before. Uh, and then we still have our second one, 
um, where we have the 1.75 on the pedal width. So that's this boundary here. Um, Um, so let's just follow like maybe down here. So, so here, uh, if we get to this point, you know, uh, we know that the length, pedal length is greater than 2.45 and the pedal width is less than uh, 1.75, right? So, um, so the pedal length is greater than this, but the, the, the pedal width is less. So, so stuff uh, to the right of this and below the line here, right? So, um, So like looking at this one, um, uh, it, it, uh, another thing that happened on decision tree uh, makes it a decision node here based on the pedal length of 4.95 and 4.85 uh, on the next level here. Right. Um, so basically it, we're going back to pedal length but, but things less than 4.85 um, and things less than 4.95, right? So, so I think the one boundary we can see when we did this, this uh, applying the decision boundary was probably the 4.95 one here. Right? So, um, So, uh, well, yeah, to interpret this, uh, I'm having to think about it a little bit, but um, um, so, you know, these are only things where the pedal width was less than 1.75, and these are things happening over here where the pedal width is greater than 1.75, right? So the, the, the stuff happening over here um, is only happening uh, for the, the, the stuff above these ones where the pedal width is bigger. Um, so uh, here, where, where the pedal width is less, uh, yeah, we, we do this decision boundary of 4.95, right? So we end up with uh, splitting out some of the wrong ones that we did before, um, uh, although we still don't get perfect, right? So most of the Versicolor are over there, but we end up with still one of Virginica. Um, uh, but we have two of the Versicolors um, uh, uh, that are bigger than 4.95. Right? So hopefully that corresponds to the stuff that comes in here. So uh, if we were to add those all up, um, the ones less than 4.95, we only have one misclassified. So most of them are Versicolor except for one, um, which you know, looks right except for that one point there. Uh, most of the rest of them are Versicolor. If we go to the right of that, uh, again, everything below that, but to the right of that, um, uh, we were doing Virginica. But in that case, we had four of them, but two of them were not Virginica uh, over here. So uh, we had one, two, three, uh, four, and then the two that were not. So, and you can imagine keep doing that if I was to let the depth keep going down some more. So. Um, All right, and then um, uh, for the places where the pedal width uh, was greater than 1.75, so that would be th things above this. Um, again, there was like one point that uh, we can't see that's probably behind one of these, uh, but it tried to make another decision boundary on that based on the pedal length of 4.85, so similar to this location, but, but going up uh, about right here somewhere, just a little bit to the left of that. Um, so yeah, based on that, there's only three samples that have a pedal length less than 4.85 that's above that line there, right? So, so again, it's, it's like only these three uh, uh, right here that are getting selected out by that um, uh, decision right there. Um, and among those three, again, uh, um, one of those must be miscolored or is behind. So, um, 
but but yeah. So so one of the points is is misclassified on these. Everything off to the right of that though um, uh, was all of the Virginica. So that's why it made that decision point there, um, um, uh, because everything that's you know pedal length less than two point four five, pedal width less than one point seven five, uh, and pedal length less than four point eight five um, um, is in. Uh, uh, the class Virginica. Um, okay, so you know, I, I, I spent a little bit of time on that because I, I kind of want people to understand that. But to summarize that, uh, you know, that's one of the powers of the decision trees is it is understandable. So it is kind of a white box. Our, our, talk, our textbook talks a little bit about white box versus black box. So compared to trying to understand uh, a fit of a logistic regression or support vector machine, uh, we could directly understand how a decision tree is making the decisions if we just examine um, uh, the model uh, the results from doing the fit. Um, um, one other thing that I wanted to mention here uh, is that uh, there is some randomness, some non-determinism um, in the way the decision tree works. So uh, we can get a slightly different decision tree even at a math, max depth of two if we start, if we start the random number generator uh, at a different point, right? So uh, another possible decision tree that could be made, I think that we will get it, hopefully this will work here, um, if we start with a random state of one, uh, but still use a max depth of two. Um, So in that case, uh, you know, it makes its first decision based on the pedal width. So again, if we visualize that, it'll, it'll probably be uh, easier to see what it's doing now. So here is another decision tree you can get sometimes uh, uh, if you have a different random uh, uh, seed, a different uh, starting point. So in this case, uh, it makes the first decision, it makes both the decisions based on the pedal width. So uh, but, but again, it can, it can completely separate the, sato the 50 Satosa from everything else um, uh, instead of using like a pedal length of what was 2.45 using a pedal length of 0 0.8, right? But we get the same Gini as we had before with the decision boundary somewhere in there versus uh, a decision boundary using pedal length somewhere between there and there. So, so we're linearly separable both on pedal width and pedal length for that class versus the other two. Uh, but then after that, um, it uses pretty much the same decision boundaries we had before on pedal width uh, for, the, for the first cut between Versicolor and Virginica. Um, so yeah, so we end up doing the 1.75 again on the pedal width uh, to get that uh, uh, 54 um, um, on the left here and, and 46 remain on the right here. Um, okay, so I uh, still got 15 more minutes, or actually more than 15 more minutes. Um, so let's try and go into a little bit of the details about how that decision tree is made, right? So, um, I mean, you know, by inspection, you could come up with a similar idea. In fact, if you've ever heard of an expert system, so this used to be kind of in the 80s, uh, people were doing a type of AI called expert systems. It was similar to this idea of a decision tree. So you have experts come in, uh, they would know their data set, um, and, and they might come up with a set of rules or uh, something that is similar to this idea of decision tree uh, in order to make decisions about a set of data. But people uh, making up the decision tree or the rules rather than doing it in an automated way, okay? So in this case, if we define, um, um, uh, we can formally come up with a mechanism to generate good decision trees uh, using this idea of uh, this impurity measure, right? Um, and this is what our textbook talks about uh, here uh, at, at this point. So. Um, So let, let me just jump 
right to make the definition of, of this Gini impurity that will that's used uh, by default for the decision trees from scikit-learn. Uh, and then we'll talk about how it's used before. So it's, it's pretty easy to uh, calculate this, right? So, so this is the, the formal no notation of this. Uh, but really all this is saying is um, 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 we want to find the ratio of um, Um, so, so this P here, I'm trying to remember exactly uh, uh, what it does, but you, you can see from here, like doing the calculation. So this is showing the, the Gini impurity uh, for um, uh, uh, this one right here. Right? In fact, uh, maybe I better go back and do the original one. Um, So let's go back and split it so it, it uses both of the features on the split uh, here. If I start at the other random seed. Um, but here, just concentrating on this, um, um, so we can, we can see uh, where this, this Gini impurity measure comes from, where that 0.168 comes from, and all the others uh, using that formalism here. So, uh, we've got a total of 54 samples, so this measure, um, uh, um, uh, we can just plug that in. It's just the sum of the squares of the ratio of each one of these to the total number of samples. So 0 over 54 squared plus 49 over 54 squared plus 5 over 54 squared. Right? So you can see those numbers come in there. Right? Um, and then you take one minus that. Right? Um, because if you work it out, you know, all three of these, they have to be some number between zero and one, right? So, um, uh, uh, but, but actually, I mean, the, the, the sum of this uh, can never be more than one. So, like, if one of these has all 54, it would be one, but all the others would be zero, okay? So, anyway, the, the, the result of this is this sum can never be a number bigger than one or smaller than zero. Uh, and then if you get one minus that, again, you'll get a number between zero and one, right? Um, so we can see, for example, let's just look at this one here, right, and do the calculation for Ginny. So whenever we have, uh, get, get to a point where everything uh, is just in one of the three classes, we're going to end up with a zero impure, impune, uh, uh, impurity, right? Um, so in this case, uh, so, you know, let's just look at the calculation of that, right? So, uh, it, so for this one here, um, it's just... Uh, We've got 50 samples, uh, so it's just 50 over 50 uh, squared minus 0 over 50 squared minus 0 over 50 squared. But of course, this is 1, and then these are both 0. So this always this is always what happens, and the result of that is you get an impurity score of 0. Right? So uh, if, if all of them are in one class, you're always going to get uh, this impurity score down to zero, right? Depending on, no matter which of the, the classes. And, and of course, this works, you know, we've only got three classes for the IRIS data set, but, you know, you can do the same thing if I've got four or five or however many classes to, to calculate one impurity score here. Right? So, uh, uh, and the other thing then to, to notice is the, the more uh, mixing you have, the higher that score is going to be, right? So this one here, if you go back and do that calculation, you'll see we end up with a 0.5 uh, on the, uh, uh, the impurity score here, okay? So... Um, so the way I kind of think about that is given a split, okay, so given, uh, so if we pick 
uh, a feature like pedal length at random, and then we f we we pick uh, a location to do our split on. Uh, but but once you have that, once you have one particular feature and um, the the place to make a decision on, um, I can calculate what the resulting um, uh, Ginny would be uh, from coming from that split. So for that 2.45, we end up with you know, a zero uh, and a 0 0.5 um, uh, on the split there. Um, So uh, I'm going to jump down here to the cart algorithm for the last 10 minutes. So uh, because this is what I was working up here, talking about the, that, that purity measure. So to understand how the decision tree automates building the decision tree uh, from a set of data that you want to classify, um, uh, we just have to understand this, right? So this is similar to what we did before. This is kind of like a cost function that we had before for the logistic uh, regression. Um, so the, the cost function wants to try and find a feature uh, and then a location on that feature that minimizes this cost here at each uh, level of the decision tree, okay? So, and, and this one is just a weighted sum, right? So all we're saying is um, 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 calculate the weighted sum uh, for some uh, feature so we're using the K feature um, and we're using a location on that feature T of K so that's what K and T of K uh, represent here so so choosing feature K and some threshold on that feature so for our iris data set that we're using on this example we only have two features pedal length and width so K is either zero uh, or one uh, depending on which feature we want to use right. Um, and then going back to this one, so our first one here, uh, so if we used a uh, pedal length of zero, so we're using the K equals zero feature, um, and the threshold that we used, that we ended up using for our first decision was at 2.45. So that means T K is 2.45. Uh, and when we did that, uh, we would have the split, right? So to figure out what the, the cost would be of that, uh, we would want to take the weighted average of these these two measures, right? So in this case, we had 50 of the 150 samples. So, so our cost J is going to be 50 over 150 had a Gini of zero uh, plus the other 100 of the 150 samples had a Gini uh, score of 0.5. So I'm just plugging these in here to hopefully uh, help you understand um, um, how this cost function is used to implement the CART, uh, which is the train algorithm that's used to fit a decision tree. Um, so, so CART is just an acronym for what? Classification and Regression Tree. Um, um, so you can use this both to fit a classification or a regression. Uh, a decision tree for a classification or, or regression task here. So, um, so yeah, I mean that's that's all this measures here. So my cost function for uh, this feature uh, being thresholded at 2.45 uh, would be that, um, which you know um, comes out as what. Uh, 50 over 150 times zero is zero, um, plus uh, two thirds of 0 0.5. So it should end up with a cost of one third on that one there. Um, Okay, so, but the way to understand why it shows that uh, as the first decision is because it's minimizing 
this function. So imagine that I could try all possible thresholds on K0, uh, you know, 0, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, uh, uh, 1, 2, so on, right? Uh, and also try all thresholds on K equals 1. Um, uh, so for every one of those I'm proposing, you know, I can, I can do a split, I can calculate the cost, uh, and then basically we just minimize that cost, right? So it, it is an optimization problem, right? Um, but because of the way this works, uh, you know, uh, again, we don't have to, uh, there's an infinite number of thresholds, um, so you can actually differentiate this. Uh, you don't have to try all the infinite number of them. Uh, in order to define the cost function um, and minimize it uh, using optimization. Yeah. So um, there is one difference though. So this is a cost function that's really only a cost function on um, um, doing one feature instead of doing all of the, the features um, at the same time. So every decision uh, uh, that we make in the decision tree, uh, we're just selecting one of our in features um, and thresholding it to get a true or false, you know, left or right decision made. Okay, so, uh, so I don't know if that, um, oops. Um, If that's uh, uh, making sense or not, but so this is a little bit different than the optimization, uh, the, the cost function that we use for logistic regression support vector machine, because we can really only optimize one feature at a time. All right, so the result of doing kind of what I described there is we will get one feature and a threshold that will minimize that cost. But um, it won't minimize, you know, over the whole decision tree. It'll, it'll just minimize for our first decision. Uh, so once I, I found that, that first decision, then, then we keep doing that, right? So basically, um, if I can go back to our decision tree here, uh, we're going to optimize to find the minimum cost uh, uh, for our first level, right? Um, and, and that was my... Um, um, calculation that was showing up there, and so once we do that, we're going to pick the pedal length feature k is zero at a threshold two point four five, uh, and then we keep doing that. So, so uh, here, you know, we can't once you get to a junior here, you can't go any further. Uh, you won't be able to uh, get better uh, uh, results. Uh, but over here, we keep splitting that. So here, we would do a search to find um, a threshold uh, and a feature. Um, uh, and pick the one that minimizes that, right? So uh, in, in this case, uh, we end up with two possible splits um, that end up with basically the same cost, right? Uh, because since, since this class is linearly separable from the other two, uh, either a line here that's at, at the, the midpoint between the two closest ones, or the line here at 2.5, Four five that's at the midpoint between those will end up with the same cost. All right, so that, that's where the randomness comes in. I believe, hopefully, I'm, I'm not misstating anything here. But since since you have things that essentially have an equivalent cost for this first decision, uh, depending on your random number generator, you might end up picking this decision boundary or that decision boundary. Okay? So there there is potentially a little bit of randomness uh, that can occur. Uh, when we fit a decision tree uh, like this. So. Um, all right. So, but but that is the, the basis of it. It's, it's probably not too important for this class that you uh, get all the nitty-gritty details, but uh, just understanding that we are automating the process of creating the decision tree. We're doing that by defining a cost function like we did uh, before when we first talked about linear and logistic regression, uh, but um, it works slightly differently um, uh, because every time we minimize that cost function, it's really only doing one decision. Uh, 
in the, uh, the, the, the tree. And then we keep doing that for every node until we either you know, reach max depth or some other stopping criteria, or we reach nodes that have a Gini of zero that can't be split any further. Yeah, so that, that would be the end of doing that. Um, Um, as a final note on this, I mean, in theory, you could define a cost function that tries to minimize the whole tree, right? So, so uh, the, the, the problem with the, the greedy cart algorithm as it's defined, as it's described, as it works, is uh, since we're only uh, picking the uh, decision that minimizes the cost here, it could be that if we pick a slightly different decision that has a higher cost, we can later on get a better split that would uh, allow us to pick uh, a, a decision that would uh, uh, do better. Right? If, if we could, if we could uh, optimize over the tree globally instead of doing it locally at each decision. But um, um, I'm sure our textbook talks a little bit about this. Uh, Performance-wise, that's, uh, uh, you can't optimize over, you can't uh, um, define a cost function that will optimize over the whole tree. Uh, I mean, you can, but um, it's prohibited. It's, it's one of those um, um, uh, NP complete. So uh, as you have a large number of data, a large number of features, uh, it would be impossible um, it would take too long to um, um, optimize over the whole tree. So instead, CART does it greedily uh, at each level of the tree, at, at each split that's done. Uh, and that allows us to get things that are probably close to the optimal overall, if we could do the, uh, if we could calculate the overall optimal uh, cost for the, uh, a tree and optimize on that. Uh, but we, we can um, actually, um, um, solve that uh, in a realistic amount of time uh, instead of taking exponential time to um, uh, calculate it. So. Um, so yeah, yeah. So discuss the textbook discusses that. So it's an example of an uh, in NP complete. So it's actually exponential in uh, M. So exponential in um, the number of features that you have. So a as you add more features. Uh, time will exponentially grow if you try to optimize uh, the whole tree uh, instead of just doing it at each level greedily. <coughs> um, okay, yep, so that's, that's it for today. That's all I wanted to kind of cover. So that's the basics of the regularization. We've got a little bit more uh, I'll, I'll talk about on Thursday. Um, the the um, um, uh, using it for regression and a few other things, um, but um, uh, but yeah, we might not have might not have like a full time next Thursday. And there's not a whole lot more to talk about on decision trees. So. All right, yeah, that's it. Uh, let you guys go. I'll go ahead and get this video posted here.